Venom breaks out of virtual machines, stolen Apple watches pair with any iPhone, Google's blocking third-party Chrome extensions, and mSpy gets owned. All that and more right now on ThreatWire. I'm Darren Kitchen, and this is ThreatWire for May 15th, 2015, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. And it is so great to be doing ThreatWire again on Hack5. So a huge thanks to everyone that has supported the relaunch on our Patreon. And with that, let's get started because, oh yes, Venom. You see, virtual machines are awesome. There's just something really beautiful about running computers and software where they can be, you know, you can have like a machine set up with tons of little servers, similar to have you have like an iPhone with tons of little apps on them. And so gone are the days of having a different physical box in the rack for every task from serving up web pages to managing email. It's great, they're cheap, they're simple, and ultimately it's better for the environment because you don't have a bunch of machines hogging up power and running idle all day. And they're pretty secure given that a virtual computer is in a little jail cell where it can't talk to the physical machine that it's running on. That is until now. The vulnerability is going by the name of Venom, which stands for Virtualized Environment Neglected Operations Manipulation. Okay, that's a backronym. But anyway, what Venom does is it takes advantage of a floppy disk controller, yes, I said a floppy disk, that if exploited would let an attacker crash the entire hypervisor or the virtual machine running all of the machines and even access other virtual machines hosted by the same hypervisor. Basically, it's like a virtual machine jailbreak, and it's kind of a big deal because much of the web and corporate infrastructure today are running on virtualization. The bug dates back to code in QEMU from 2004, and it impacts a lot of virtualization platforms like Xen, KVM, and VirtualBox. All of which, by the way, are my personal favorites because they're open source. You see the proprietary VMware and, say, Microsoft's Hyper-V platforms? Those aren't affected. Patches have been uh, issued, advisories are out there, and so everybody is urged to update. Got yourself an Apple Watch? Well, keep it on your wrist because iDownloadBlog is reporting on a security concern for the new Nerd Bling. Okay, let's take a moment to talk about Activation Lock. It's a feature that debuted in iOS 7, which prevents iOS devices from being activated after being factory reset without first disabling the Find My iPhone feature. This came out at the time when iPhones were getting stolen a lot, and it's really great because it makes a stolen iPhone basically a really expensive brick. Unfortunately, the feature is sorely lacking in watchOS 1.0, and there's no equivalent to find my iPhone for the Apple Watch. So if yours gets stolen, then it can easily be reset and paired with another iPhone. The good news, however, is that the data on the device is secure if you have in fact enabled a passcode lock, which you should do. Similar to third-party apps on Android, Chrome has the ability to install third-party extensions not found in their official Chrome web store. And that said, there has been a lot of difficulty getting them installed. You see, last year, Google disabled the feature in the stable branch of Chrome for Windows. And unfortunately, people have still been getting tricked into installing malicious extensions by being forced to download a developer version of Chrome. That's right, now a year later, Google is disabling the feature in all versions of Chrome for Windows and Mac, so you can still install third-party extensions, it's just not as convenient. You gotta click Tools, Extensions, Check Developer Mode, and import a CRX file. Seriously, this is kind of crazy, because it used to be that to do a drive-by attack, you just required somebody to click Yes to an ActiveX plugin. Who are these people that are going as far as to download a developer version of Chrome just so that they can load a malicious extension and get owned? It, it truly boggles the mind. MSpy is a software as a service that lets users track iPhones and Apple devices and Windows and Mac computers. Uh, don't think find my iPhone if it gets stolen. Think more like, I'm concerned that my spouse is cheating, or I'm an overprotective parent who doesn't trust my teenager. Well, the software not only does it do GPS tracking, but it'll intercept messages from Snapchat, Skype, WhatsApp, SMS, and all around key logging. It's, it's spyware, and it boasts over a million customers worldwide. Well, now it can also boast a million owned customers. That's right, a dump of the mSpy database has found its way onto a Tor site containing info on more than 400,000 users, including their Apple IDs, passwords, tracking data, payment details, photos, emails, you know, all this stuff you don't want leaked all over the web. It's kind of ironic that the software used by overprotective parents is the same undoing of their kids who have now been all but doxxed. It's there's a great write-up. Go check it out on Krebs on Security. We'll have links in the description. 
Our featured comment comes from Zex, who pointed out that among the NSA bashing last week, we were ignoring the fact that the Googles and Microsofts of the world have way more information on us than mere metadata, and that we're supposed to just take their word for it that they're not using for any ill intent. And this is the sort of intelligent conversation that I love about our YouTube comments. That's right, I said intelligent and YouTube comments. This is an anomaly, I love this. And yes, I think there's a really interesting parallel between the concept of, say, government and their citizens bound by their laws versus a corporation and their end users bound by their end user license agreement. And I guess the hope is that between the two, they balance each other out, but ultimately, I feel like it's only up to ourselves to protect us from both parties, really. Well, anyway, thank you so much for the comment. Zex, do you guys have any thoughts on the stories today? Go ahead and leave them below. And before I go, I do want to give a huge thanks to everyone who has supported the show so far on Patreon. You can find all of the ways to support over at patreon.com slash threatwire. And if you can spare a few cents, you know, if you are finding value from this show, you want to give some value back, it is just epic to see that. And it allows us to even feature potentially your fur baby like these cute guys. So cute. Keep sending in those fur babies. We are hoping to reach our three times a week milestone goal with a rotation of Patrick Norton and Shannon Morse and myself. And so throughout the month of May, we're giving you a taste of just that. So I hope you will continue to contribute and help us keep this coming completely independent and ad free. And if you can't, that's totally cool. You know, even just a share, a like, a subscribe, all of that goes a long way too. So you can find all of the other episodes, links to our social networks and all the other ways to contribute over at threatwire.net. And with that, I'm Darren Kitchen. I'll see you on the internet.